So this is problem number four from the 2021 AP stats for your response set. And problem number four from 2021 was the question that dealt with inference. So the situation that we're faced with here says that a large company sells pet supplies online. The manager wants to increase online sales by encouraging repeat purchases. They believe that if past customers are offered $10 off their next purchase, more than 40% of them will make another order. To investigate the belief, 90% of customers who placed an order within the past year are selected at random. Each of the selected customers is sent an email with a coupon for $10 off the next purchase if the order is placed within 30 days. Of those who receive the coupon, 38 replace an order. Part A asks us to decide is there convincing statistical evidence at the significance level of 0.05, so 5% significance level, that the manager's belief is correct. Complete the appropriate inference procedure to support your answer. So the inference procedure that we're dealing with here is definitely a significance test. They give us the significance level. They're not asking us to build a confidence interval. So we're doing a significance test. And what you'll hear us discuss as we go through this video is what I refer to as the four-step process. So the four-step process is going to always start with stating a population parameter that you're trying to make a judgment about. We are trying to make a judgment about the proportion of customers that place a second order after receiving a $10 off coupon. With the significance test, we also need to make sure that we explicitly state our null hypothesis as well as our alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is going to be an equation. And the alternative hypothesis is going to have to be stated based on information in the problem statement. So if you go back and you reread this, the manager believes more than 40% will replace another order if they're given this coupon. So we're trying to look for significant enough evidence to suggest that the manager's belief seems like it is likely to be true. Now in the plan, we're going to want to name the procedure we're using. There is only one sample here, right? This is 90 customers who placed an order within the past year. So there's definitely only one sample. We're definitely dealing with a proportion, right? The proportion of customers that would place another order. Proportions are always going to deal with Z scores rather than T scores. And we are trying to make a judgment about a population proportion. In order for you to use this inference procedure, certain conditions need to be satisfied. One of them is that there is randomness. And 90 customers who placed an order in the past year are selected at random. So a random sample is definitely used. We need to make sure that we have independence being maintained. And when you're sampling, independence is going to be maintained as long as the sample size, which in this case is 90, is less than or equal to 10% of the full population that you're trying to make a judgment about. Now the population in this case is all customers that made an order within the past year. Those are the people who are eligible to be selected for this. So as long as we had more than 900 people place an order within the past year, and the fact that they say that this is a large company kind of implies, yeah, that is gonna be the case. We do have the 10% condition maintained. And then the last thing that we wanna have explicitly stated and show that it's also true is the large counts condition for proportions. So for, for inference procedures for means, the central limit theorem applies. I'd be worried that maybe some students would want to say, well, since the sample size is above 30, my sampling distribution is going to be approximately normal since the central limit theorem ensures so, but that only applies to sampling distributions for sample means. We are definitely dealing with sample proportion here. So the large counts condition is what needs to be satisfied in order to ensure that our sampling distribution for our sample proportion is approximately normal. So to, to check that, you check that your sample size times the null hypothesis value of, of 0.4. You check that that is greater than 10. Uh, you also check that the complement of that calculation. So 90 times uh, 1 minus 0.4 is greater than or equal to 10. In this case, both of them are. Therefore, our sampling distribution for our sampling proportion will be approximately normal. We want to use a calculation from the formula sheet. I'll click over to that briefly here. So the sampling distribution section of the formula sheet is on the second page. And the proportion, 
portion of that is the top third of that second page. So we are trying to find a sampling, a, a standard deviation, excuse me, for a sampling distribution for our sample proportion. So we're going to run this calculation here. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily going to be standard error in this case because we're assuming the null hypothesis is true throughout your work. You're always assuming the null hypothesis is true throughout any significance test until you develop evidence that it's not. So I'm using this version of the formula. So you see I've already applied that here. And the standard deviation for our sampling distribution for this sample proportion ends up being 0 0.052. Now you do have to show the computation for your z-score. Window might be off a little bit here. I don't know if you can see the bottom of that. Uh, so the calculation for the z-score is going to be the sample proportion, which is going to be 38 over 90. So that's where I got this 0.42 minus the assumed to be true proportion, which is from the null hypothesis, divided by the standard deviation for the sampling distribution that we just computed. So our z-score ends up being 0.38. You do want to show that you know how to work this with a normal distribution. So I have my normal curve drawn right here. I have my uh, zero since it's standardized, right? This is a z-score. I'm standardized. So I have zero in the center. 0.34 is obviously a little bit above zero. And then my p-value is going to be whatever the area of this upper tail is. And I'm looking at the upper tail because of what my alternative hypothesis was. I'm trying to decide what the probability is that I end up with a sample statistic as extreme or more extreme as the one that we got if this null hypothesis value is in fact the population proportion. If you use your calculator, normal CDF calculation on the calculator to determine that p-value, uh, you end up with 0 0.35. 0 0.35 is well above the significance level of 0.05. And if your p-value ends up being above the significance level, you don't have evidence to suggest that the alternative is true over the null. So we're not going to reject. You see I have written out my conclusion in context here. That's definitely something else you always want to make sure you do within a significance test and an FRQ, uh, as well as explicitly comparing the p-value with alpha. There's one more part to this particular problem, and that final part is based on the conclusion that we just made, which of the two errors, type 1 or type 2, could have been made within that work. Interpret the consequence of that error within context. So there's the truth about the population across this top row, and there's the decision that we make about it. So the truth about the population is either that we should fail to reject the null or that we should reject the null. We decide to do one of those same things. Now, if we end up with the same choice, we decide the same as what the truth is, there's no error, right? That happens here. Truth is that we should have rejected, and that is actually what we did. If we fail to reject, and that is what the truth should be, there's no error in this spot either. So these are not the boxes that represent the place where you encounter an error. The place where you encounter an error is if we reject the null, but really we should not have, or if we should not have rejected the null and we actually ended up doing so. Our work in part A was that we failed to reject the null. What if the truth about the population is that we should have rejected it? What if we would have had more than 40% of the customers repeat a purchase if they were given a $10 off coupon? So this is the type of error that we could have present within our conclusion. So because we failed to reject the null hypothesis, we could have encountered type 2 error within our conclusion. You do have to make sure you talk about the, the consequence of that within context. So that's going to mean that in actuality, more than 40% of customers would come back to the website and make another purchase if they were given the $10 off coupon. We said that that's not the case. So the company is going to have more than 40% of people repeat a purchase if they're given this $10 off coupon, but they might not actually use that strategy with their customers because our conclusion is saying, no, that's, that's not necessarily going to be the case based on the fact that we don't have significant enough evidence to suggest that 
it will actually occur. So we have all the context being laid out across these last few sentences, and that is number four from 2021.